Well, um, I would say that white collar crime would be crime committed um, by the wealthier sections of society. Um, uh, I'm not sure if I necessarily believe this, but I, I've heard it as like a, as a definition that white collar crime is any crime that doesn't have a victim, or is like a victimless crime, there we go. Mm. Which is interesting because I'm not sure that I would agree with that, but I feel like <clears throat> if you were to, um, um, you know, if someone, were, if someone were to say white collar crime, that, that might be like the first thing that comes to people's mind. <laughs> what do you think white collar crime is? I think white collar crime is, well. Uh, white collar crimes can be, uh, in, in my knowledge and experience, can be embezzlement, uh, computer-rated crimes. Um, you know, there, there's been a lot of stories lately about different uh, officers who are part of law enforcement associations stealing money from the association. Uh, that's basically a white-collar crime in, in my book. What is white-collar crime? Well, there's the technical sense, which is a term that was coined in the 1930s by a sociologist Edwin Sutherland. He, um, he put two words, white and collar, in front of the word crime to describe what people in positions of power, business owners, would do. Um, he hoped to change society a little bit. He wanted to make it so that people in positions of power were deprived of certain rights of due process because they had such access to money and influence, legal aid, things of that nature. Whether that was successful or not, who knows. But realistically what he did was he put two words, as I said, white and collar, in front of the word crime. So he essentially provided them with new ammunition, a kind of language to hide behind. After all, at the end of the day, it's only crime. It's usually referred to as the theft of money. Whether you go by the FBI's definition or, um, or the traditional definition, that's what it is. But what is white collar really? It's nothing. It's a ghost. It's a phantom. It's really an empty word. Because all we've done is recreated a definition for something that already exists. And the result of that is that it's difficult to prosecute, it's difficult to define, it's difficult to find, it's difficult to make go away. Wall Street Bank Goldman Sachs will pay five billion dollars to settle claims that it duped clients with rotten mortgage investments that Goldman knew were likely to fail. This was part of the widespread mortgage fraud that triggered the Great Recession in 2008. Goldman is the last of the big banks to settle with the government, and Dean Reynolds has more on this. News of the $5 billion settlement thrust Goldman Sachs into the glare of the public spotlight and the crosshairs of the presidential campaign. They are a fraudulent organization. The Wall Street firms engaged in greed, massive greed. In February, Morgan Stanley settled for $3.2 billion. Wells Fargo agreed to pay $1.2 billion. J.P. Morgan Chase paid $13 billion three years ago. And Bank of America coughed up a whopping $16.6 billion in 2014. Goldman admitted that in bundling mortgages from subprime loan specialists like Countrywide Financial and then selling them to investors as bonds, it largely failed to address financial problems it knew about. In one period during August 2006, Goldman found what it called an unusually high percentage of loans with credit and compliance defects. When one transaction manager was asked by Goldman officials, how do we know that we caught everything? He answered, we don't. Another responded, depends on what you mean by everything. And when an outside analyst wrote a positive review of Countrywide, the head of due diligence at Goldman wrote in an email, if they only knew. This was a civil case, so no one is going to jail, and that's likely to add to the anger, according to Robert Weissman of Public Citizen, an advocacy group. Millions of people were thrown out of jobs. Millions of people lost their homes. Communities were destroyed, all because of their wrongdoing, yet they are escaping any criminal accountability, it seems. While a $5 billion civil penalty is a lot of money, Scott, approximately half of it appears to be tax deductible, which means... Goldman Sachs will be getting a tax break that could shave close to a billion dollars off the money it has just agreed to pay. Dean Reynolds reporting tonight. Dean, thank you. So what is white collar crime? Is it the theft of money? The theft of services? How do we define something when no one can agree on what it is 
when it occurs, who does it, and how it should be prosecuted. Why do we call it embezzlement? Right. When it's you stolen. Yeah, you stolen it. Yeah. I'll give you an example. There's so uh, during the 2008 housing crisis, there was one big firm kind of at the center, which was Goldman Sachs. Yeah. Now nobody at Goldman Sachs faced any charges whatsoever, except for one Russian programmer. Mm-hmm. Right. His name was Sergey uh, Alenikov, and he was charged with stealing computer code. Okay. Very sensitive computer yeah. code. The problem is he never actually stole the code. Yeah, it was open source code that's available freely on the internet, and it was his, and he wrote the code. Yeah, and he used it, but because he used it in the course of his business at Goldman Sachs, they considered it their property because it's he used it on their servers. Yeah. So when he left with it, and he had a copy of the program on his flash drive, which for him wasn't unusual. He's a programmer. That's right. what he does. They they charged him with theft yeah. of proprietary information. Now, the interesting part is this was eight years ago, a little mm-hmm. over eight years ago. He, all of his cases have been acquitted, and they've tried to they've retried him several mm-hmm. times for the exact same crime. Okay. It's now 2016. He's facing the same charge again. Yeah. But he hasn't done anything. Yeah. The only thing he did was leave Goldman Sachs to go work for another firm. Right. And, and the funny thing is, if this was murder, yeah. and he was cleared eight years ago, they couldn't charge him with the same wouldn't crime. Be, so so why is it that you can't you know, charge somebody twice for the same crime, right. you know, when it comes to murder and the criminal law, but white collar law uh, and stuff, you can do it until you just say it's not financially worth it anymore. Here's the interesting thing. The, the lead prosecution says this is a simple case of theft. Yeah. He took something that didn't belong to him yeah. and he needs to be pr- tried for it. Yeah. Right. So when he's prosecuting him, he's breaking it down into simple language. He's saying yeah. it's simply theft and we need to press charges on this guy. You know, what's interesting, though. The lead prosecutor, the FBI agent who was in charge of this case, Mm -hmm. was a former employee of Goldman Sachs. Ah. Ah. Now, it's interesting that you say it because it's so complex, right? When the FBI describes white collar crime, they say the lead, the number one thing standing in the way of investigation and prosecution is the complexity of the crimes. Yeah. So when they can't try it, right, when they can't prosecute, they say it's because it's complex. Yeah. But when he, it, they are prosecuting, prosecuting, they say it's not complex. Yeah. It's simple. He stole something. So why are we using two different terminologies? Right. Yeah, it's political at right. that point. <laughs> Considering that for a moment, which one do you think is worse? You know, your your bank that steals fifty bucks from you, or the person that breaks into your house? Steals fifty dollars from you. Um, I think. Well, personally, I feel like the bank because you put trust in the bank. You. Expect, expect them to help you out and to to be honorable. You know what I mean? Like the person who breaks into your house, you don't know anything about them. Right. You don't. You know, people generally don't expect other people to be honorable. I mean, some people do. I think it depends on if you're optimistic. But <laughs> but for the most part, you know, you don't like. Why why would you lock your door at night if you if you didn't expect someone to break in or if you didn't think that, that was a possibility? Whereas like, why would you put your money in the bank if you expected them to take it from you? You know what I mean? Like, there's just like there's just like this general belief that we can trust in the infrastructure around us we can trust the banks we can trust people who you know who who are basically in charge of what's going on in the world you know what i mean they have a lot of power they have a lot of influence we just hope that, they, that they're doing right by us and most of the time they're not you know what i mean and there's not really a whole lot you can do about it mm. why um i would uh, <laughs> you know because it's a it's a very high like a large system, a lot of people, a lot of money, you know what I mean? Like it's like toppling an, 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 toppling an empire. Mm. It's like toppling an empire. <laughs> That's how I think of it, as not being violent, but violating laws of, you know, like stealing money, um, uh, insider trading, that kind of thing. Hmm. So <laughs> ultimately you arrived at stealing money, but to get to stealing money, you went through a roundabout way of describing a lot of things. Why do you suppose that is? Because we are conditioned to think of white collar crime differently than we think of other crimes. Why do you think that is? All right, the bombshell came from a government attorney earlier this week. The theft of a proprietary trading code from Goldman Sachs could lead to market manipulation if it fell into the wrong hands. 
Bloomberg columnist Jonathan Weil wants to know more about that bombshell and whose hands it happens to be in right now. He joins us. Uh, it's a very interesting story, and a lot of people are starting to raise questions about what, are, what is Goldman Sachs doing with this trading code that could manipulate the market? Run for your lives if it gets in the wrong hands. It, it, it's a hell. Of, it's a. It's an incredible statement that this prosecutor made, and just to put it in some context of of what he made it, he was trying to get this particular defendant. Uh, Sergei Lenikov, I may have botched the Russian pronunciation on that, but he was trying to get him, get the court on the 4th of July to declare him a danger to the community so he wouldn't post bail. So if there's anything, there is a bit of an incentive to exaggerate the harm that could come well, with this. The interesting thing, yeah. I think your column sets it up nicely, and if you didn't read it at home, you can check it out on our yeah. website, Bloomberg.com. Uh, this guy, just to set it up for the viewer, was working at Goldman. He switched over now to Citadel, but in the meantime, he had uploaded some code. Uh, and Goldman got on the phone to the Justice Department and got them so fast to nail this guy, it's almost, you wonder if they have a red line to the government. It, 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 it is amazing. Within one day of Goldman calling, they had FBI agents at his driveway doing surveillance. The next day they arrested him coming off a flight from uh, in Newark Airport. And you would think, you know, if a customer ever called up the Justice Department and complained that, you know, some big Wall Street bank just ripped me off, do you think that the, they would send FBI agents out that They quickly? might have stronger connections over at Gold, Goldman Sachs. <laughs> I think so. Uh, it's interesting that the prosecutor, from the testimony that I read, mm -hmm. it almost sounds as if he is working at Goldman Sachs. I mean, he's saying that, you know, this guy has stolen this uh, code which may impede, you know, our market our market cap or Goldman's market cap. It's, it's very interesting. You do wonder how much due diligence and how much investigation the FBI could have done on this case in two days uh, before they arrested this fellow. And just, this quote is worth reading in its entirety. If, if, can, I, can I just Please tell do. You? Please do. Uh, here's what the 34-year-old prosecutor, Joseph Fachapanti, the bank has raised the possibility that there is a danger that somebody who knew how to use this program could use it to manipulate markets in unfair ways. If there's that sort of program, why does Goldman Sachs get to hold it? Oh, exactly. That's a good question. Yeah, why, should, why should all of us trust Goldman Sachs to not use it in unfair ways, whatever those ways are, which he did not elaborate on?